say a few words of thanks before I start, because um, this is a big occasion for me. I know that a lot of effort has been made to get me here tonight, and I really want to thank everyone on the Philadelphia Stories staff and the, and the board um, so that I could have this very personal and intimate evening with you. It means very much. And someone earlier asked me, is this a validation of your work? Of course, it is a validation, but it is. It's really more than that. It really feels like a personal milestone in my life. And, um, sorry, <laughs> one of the first times that I feel like a real writer. So this award just feels fantastic. I would also like to give a tremendous thank you to the McGlynn family. If this were the Philadelphia Stories Award, I would be very honored to get it. But I know that this is something that is even more personal than that. This is a gift from a husband to the memory of his wife. And uh, so I feel very, very honored to receive it. And I want to say along those lines that I'm really thrilled that my husband, Gavin, uh, can be here with me tonight. And that it's very fitting that I should be getting an award from, or that is given from a husband in memory of a wife. Because for the last two years, Gavin has largely worked and made the income that allows me to write. So I just want to give my deepest thanks to those of you who support writing, not just for writers themselves, because those of you who choose to support writing, your love and your faith for writing are really thankless, and you have very little chance of ever being recognized for them. But really, if you did not support writers, even the most talented and stubborn writer would probably give up at some point. And so I just want to say, uh, Tom, thank you so much for this award. And I imagine that you were there for Marguerite, even though she sounded as though she was very determined to continue writing, no matter what. And I admire that vision. But I just I want to say that I am sure that there were times when you were there for Marguerite in a way that the Gavin has been there for me when my uh, faith and my love and my work has faltered. So I'd like everyone to raise their glass and give a round of applause to both Tom and Gavin, without whom there would be less writing in this world. <laughs> right. 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 I just want to read a very short excerpt here. Uh, thank you for the introduction, because it gives a little bit of cultural background. The main character in this story is called Lin Wee. And he's someone who has already gone to Gold Mountain twice, wants to work in the uh, gold rush, and wants to work in the mid-1860s on the Transcontinental Railroad. And now he leads a very comfortable life in his South China village with his wife and his son. But when he did work on the railroad in the winter of 1866, there was a very brutal winter, this is a true fact, that set in east of the Sierra or the Chinese crews that were working on that particular section of track. And they faced very brutal snows and temperatures that they were not at all acclimated for. And quite a few of them died. And because the winter was so hard, and because come spring they were quickly pushed down to lay new track, a lot of these bodies were never retrieved. And so if you know anything about kind of traditional Chinese culture, the body needs to be retrieved and sent back to the native village where ancestors can properly tend to the spirits in the afterlife. So in this particular section, I'm starting just a little bit in, and it's, it's not long. But Lin Wei has been repeatedly approached by his villagers as a fairly lucky guy, and as someone who's worked on the railroads, to go back to Gold Mountain a third time to retrieve four bodies of fellow villagers that still lie east of the Sierra, and he resists their efforts. And I'm choosing to read the section where he finally, finally leaves it. It's called East of the Sierra, and I, I think it's coming out in, in December yeah. in Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. Yes, Sierra? the winter issue. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. After the third visit from the villagers, Lin Wee's mind began the journey back east of the Sierra. He did not want to return. But the darkness over his bed opened like a door, and he found himself back on the high plains, whipped by dust. He found himself back on a land that had cost too much to blast and scrape for track, 
A place to be traveled over and not one to stay. A place where white men feared their wagons might break a wheel, their horses an ankle, where the snow might fall early. From this warm, faded, stubborn soil, leaves did not grow so much green as gray. Here the wind could twist the trunk of a tree into the knots of an old man's knuckle. Here in the bleached sweep between the Sierra and the Washoe Mountains, winter fell hard and fast in December 1866. Men disappeared under the drifts that crashed like waves. Here he made promises to the broken and the dying. He swore to man like his friend Shen that he would not leave his fellow Tung Yun to spend an eternity in the foul soil of the eastern Sierra, or worse, in the rusty stretches of Nevada sands. He would help them with their wrong way, their glorious return home to Pearl River, to Sunning County, so that their children and grandchildren could see them into the spirit world with chickens and lychees and all the money that the men never made working themselves to death on Gold Mountain. The door closed and Lin Gui stared into the darkness. He could not refuse an obligation of his own making. He would settle his debts, right his wrong to Shen. Reaching out a hand, he found the soft hump of his wife's hip. I am going back to Golden Mountain, he said. I am taking Chi. She rolled from his hand and onto her back. Chi wants this? Her words surprised him. They suggested that he should have asked his son's permission. It is an honor, he reminded her. Yes, she said. In the moonlight, he saw her hands go to her face. Then we thought again. Chi must see Gold Mountain for himself, he said. All the young men talk about Gold Mountain. Better that she go now and be done with it. You know, he's already asked me about such a trip. It was a lie. Neither spoke for some time. See the fortune teller, she finally said. Begin the trip on an auspicious day. Did his wife think he had lost his head? Of course, Lin Wee said. Then, I am sorry to leave again. The first time he left, he was gone over two years. The second almost as long. He knew the song the washerwoman sang down at the river, the one about marrying Gold Mountain men, about dusty sheets and spider webs on the bed. He did not like to think of his own wife calling out the words. He said his wife's name, pulled the hands from her eyes. It will not be as long this time, he reassured. There is a new steamship, an iron giant. The passage is now four weeks, half of what it was. We will be gone only a season, three months. In the meantime, first uncle will help with the fields. Have you forgotten what it was like there, she asked. No, he said. She looked at the black ceiling, and I have not forgotten.